mics or cameras. If you have any questions, please save them for the end. Um, you can use either the, the raise your hand function in Teams or just use the chat box and, and type your question and we'll try to answer those uh, once again at the end of, of the presentation. Um, this is going to be a, a relatively quick one, um, so about 30 minutes um, and then we'll give some time for, for some Q&A. Uh, but our topic for today is, is how to implement a successful training program. Um, so our learning objectives for today is, is we're going to find out why training is important, uh, the steps to delivering a training program, the steps to developing training content, implementing a training program, and continuous improvement of uh, the training program, of your training program. So first, I want to thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules um, to learn more about how to implement a successful training program. Uh, my name is Tyler Williams. I'm the Chief Technical Officer here at CSQ, um, and I'm really excited to, to talk on this topic today because it's, it's a topic that uh, a lot of people, I think a lot of facilities have training programs, um, but they're not as robust as what they would like them to be. And so hopefully with the knowledge you gain from this uh, webinar, you'll be able to take that back to your organization and create a more robust uh, training program. Uh, first, I wanna give a little bit of background uh, with CSQ and uh, who we are uh, for those of you who might not know. Uh, so CSQ was launched in 2020 to promote industry best practices and improve the overall safety and quality of cannabis and cannabis infused products in the market. The CSQ certification program was built around ISO and the Global Food Safety Initiative benchmarking requirements. Our vision is to become the cannabis industry's most trusted source for safety and quality certification, and our mission is to provide the cannabis industry with reliable and trusted industry standards that can help certified sites minimize risk and protect their brand as well as the health and well-being of consumers around the world. Our goals as an organization is to create global standardization, promote fair trade, and protect consumers. And then our, our overall goal is, once again, to be the cannabis industry's most trusted source for safety and quality certification. So now let's dive into what we're really here about. Uh, so training. So why is training important? Um, first, let's go through the reasons to have a training program. Obviously, uh, to meet compliance to local regulations, whether that's state or, or your country or city requirements, uh, compliance to third party standards such as CSQ, GMP, et cetera. Uh, it can improve your employee retention by having a, a robust training program and, and giving your uh, employees the tools they need to succeed from the get go. Um, it makes a big difference in employee retention. Uh, it can reduce safety related issues, including complaints, non-conformances, recalls and withdrawals. It protects your brand and reputation. You can reduce operational costs through eliminating inefficiencies and waste. And then it creates a positive safety culture for your organization. Uh, now, what are the, the consequences for not having a robust training program? You could have legal and financial consequences. So you could be fined uh, by your regulators or even shut down. Uh, you can fail your third party or second party audit, uh, poor employee retention. Uh, you can get complaints or poor brand reputa reputation. Uh, you can have a recall or withdrawal, which is probably the, the most expensive of, of these. Um, and then high operational costs you know, due to inefficiencies. And then it can have a negative impact on your company's culture. Um, so real quick, I do want to go over what the minimum requirements uh, for CSQ certification is for training. Um, so for HACCP, it is required that at least one person be trained in a HACCP course that is accredited uh, to the International HACCP Association. Um, so that is likely not going to be a training that you do internally. Uh, but the good thing is you only have to have one person uh, with that training, and most likely that's going to be the person responsible for uh, creating or developing your HACCP plan and maintaining it uh, as, as your, your facility changes over time. Um, CSQ 101 training, uh, this is provided by CSQ. It is not mandatory as long as one individual um, or the individuals responsible for managing the CSQ system um, can either demonstrate competence 
or understanding of the CSQ uh, requirements, either through relevant work experience or just by showing, uh, demonstrating uh, their competence to their auditor. Um, same with internal auditor training. It is not necessarily a, a requirement. However, um, if your individuals do, cannot demonstrate their competence to internal auditing, then it would be marked as a nonconformance. Um, there are several internal auditing courses out there. Once again, that might not be a course that you, you teach internally, um, but depending on the experience of the person who is conducting your internal audits, it might not be needed. Uh, security training uh, must be provided to all employees responsible for on-site security, whether that's your security guards, uh, frontline employees, whoever that might be. Um, we need to make sure that they are, are trained in security. Um, and then lastly, CGMP or CGAP, depending on if you're on the grow or manufacturing side or maybe both, um, it is required for all employees who are going to be entering processing and growing areas. Uh, so even if your HR person is going to be entering processing and growing areas, which most of the time they're not, but it, in some cases, especially for small to medium sized businesses, that might be the case they even need to be trained in those requirements uh, because anytime that they're stepping into those sensitive uh, high risk areas, we want to make sure that they have the proper training. So what are the steps to developing a training program? I've broken this down into to eight steps. And so the first step is to assess your training need. Uh, then you need to establish training goals. Uh, from there, you need to determine who should be trained and, and really what they should be trained on. And then step four, determine when employees should be trained, so how frequently. Um, then you need to create training content to present to your, your employees and train them on. Um, you need to then implement your training program. Uh, from there, once the training program is implemented, you need to make sure that you're maintaining records. And then lastly, uh, continually to reassess your, your training program and improve in any ways possible and make sure you're staying up to date with things that may change in, in the regulatory atmosphere or uh, maybe changes in your facilities such as new equipment or new processes. Um, and we're going to go over each one of these steps uh, individually here shortly. Um, so the first one, assessing your training needs. Um, there's really three key steps involved in a training needs analysis. Um, and so the first step is to decide on skill sets. So what are the skill sets that your team members are required to have in order to do their jobs properly, right? So once we determine that, then we need to evaluate the skills of our employees. So what skills do our employees currently have? So let's look at those skill sets that we, we decided on in step one and then evaluate our employees based on those skill sets. And then from there, we move to step three. So now we know what skills they have and what skills they're missing. So now we can identify the gaps between those skill sets and determine uh, what our training needs are and how can we improve our, our current training program. Um, so some of the benefits to, to conducting a, a training needs analysis and note that a, a training needs analysis you can do internally yourself, um, but also there are companies out there um, who can do a third party uh, training needs analysis um, and that might be beneficial more so for bigger organizations, um, but it, you can do it internally as well. And some of the benefits to a trainings need analysis are identifying knowledge gaps before they become a problem. It helps you plan your training needs, highlights training you may not have considered. It ensures your training is focused on the right areas. It helps you decide who should attend which training sessions, and it helps prioritize training needs. So now that we've assessed um, our training needs and we've done that training needs analysis, now we need to establish training goals. And so we've broken this down into seven steps, um, and this is just for establishing your goals and, and how to make sure that you're meeting and, and or exceeding your training goals. So step one, identify the why. So begin with the end in mind. Um, this is, you know, from one of my favorite books, the the seven habits of highly effective people, uh, beginning with the end in mind, and is is one of those habits. And 
what we mean here is, you know, why are, why are we conducting this training? Well, maybe we're having uh, issues with employees washing their hands at the appropriate frequency. Um, so now that's our goal, right, is to make sure that employees are, are washing their hands at, a, at the appropriate frequency. So now that we have the, the end in mind, now we can create a training around that, right? Um, so that, that's what we mean by that. Uh, step two is align training to business needs. Um, so what we're really focusing is on is your safety and quality training. Uh, but there's there's other training that's important to your business goals and, and making sure that those trainings align with those needs uh, is very important. And those could be things such as soft skills, onboarding training, uh, anything like that. Uh, could be internal pr uh, procedures and processes that may not relate to safety and quality. Um, those those are should be thought of when you're you're establishing these training goals as well. Uh, step three is get set smart goals and smart is an acronym that we'll go over on the next slide. Um, so I, I'll touch on that next. Um, and then step four, achieve small wins with milestones. So um, a lot of companies, what they tend to do is just do an annual training for everybody and think that they're done. Um, when you do your training like that, um, it might it might meet the minimum requirements for whatever standard you're getting certified to or your regulatory requirements, um, but it doesn't really have that great of effect with on uh, your employees retaining that information. So breaking up your, your trainings over throughout the year and creating uh, milestones for your employees really helps them under, uh, uh, retain the information and it, it gives them some sense of achievement uh, throughout the year instead of just doing all you know 10 or 20 trainings that you might have uh, in the beginning or end of the year. Uh, step five, measure progress consistently. So we need to measure to make sure that we're meeting our goals or, or getting close to, and if we're not, then we need to, to be agile and adjust from there. Uh, we need to make training goals visible. So make sure your employees are aware of your, your training goals um, and where they stand and, and how close they are to meeting those goals. And then step seven is celebrate. So once once your employees have completed all of their trainings um, that they need throughout the year, um, then we need to celebrate um, that achievement and, and make sure that they're aware that they're on the right track to meeting our, our greater goals as a company. OK, so with establishing SMART goals, this, this is what we mean. So specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. Um, so your objectives or goals must be clear and well defined. That's that's what we mean by uh, specific. Obviously, we need the goals to be measurable. Uh, without a way to measure your success, you miss out on the celebration that we were talking about on the the previous slide. Uh, we need to make sure that it's possible to achieve the goals. Right, um, saying that we want all of our employees, you know, and maybe we have a forty uh, employee facility and we want all of them to get certified to an accredited HACCP course. That gets really expensive and, and it's likely that senior management isn't gonna approve that. And there's no reason for every single employee um, to have an accredited HACCP training. Um, so we need to make sure that our, our goals are achievable and uh, there's no restraints with, it, with budgets or anything like that. Uh, we need to make sure our goals are relevant and aligned with the direction of the business. And then uh, we need to make sure our goals have a deadline. So uh, when you're working on a deadline, your sense of urgency increases. Um, and so in theory, your achievement will come quicker. Um, so that is what we mean by SMART goals, um, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. So now that we've set our goals, let's determine who should be trained. So there's two stages in this next step. Um, determining who needs to be trained and determining what they need to be trained on. Um, so who needs to be trained? We need to know what employees or departments, teams or committees. Um, for example, um, if you're operating an edibles facility, um, you are probably going to have a HACCP team and a food defense team. Those may or may not be the same people and those have different training needs and requirements. So we need to think about that. Same with departments. The sanitation department is going to have a lot different training requirements than the maintenance department or, or sales, for example. Um, the next thing we need to be thinking about when we're determining who needs to be trained is we need to make sure we're not overlooking anyone. Uh, a lot of times a maintenance is, is always in the facility working on equipment and things like that. 
uh, a lot of times people forget to train their maintenance people on things like good manufacturing practices. They still need to be washing their hands, wearing hairnets, all of those things, uh, just like anyone else who is in that processing area. So we need to make sure that they're trained on that. Uh, sales, it's always good to train sales on, on safety and quality, um, mainly as, as more of a business function. Uh, so when your sales team is talking to people, you know, they can say, um, that, you know, our facility is certified CGMP or certified to CSQ. And, um, you know, this is what that means. And, and this is what we do at our facility to ensure that we're making safe products. Um, managers is another one that often gets overlooked. Normally the training gets pushed on the frontline employees and, and managers feel that they don't need to take the training because of their experience. It's always good to at least have some sort of refresher training. Uh, HR is another one, uh, especially if your HR is the one training people. We need to make sure that they have uh, the appropriate training so that when they are training people, um, they're not just blowing smoke, right? Um, and then the last thing we need to remember is your audience. Um, we're all in an industry, uh, cannabis, where we're working with, with adults um, over the age of 21 most of the time. And with that, uh, we need to remember uh, that adult learners are different from, uh, you know, kids in college or, or in high school. And we'll touch a little bit on that on the next slide, what I mean by adult learners and, and what you can kind of expect and, and how uh, adult learners learn uh, differently from your traditional students. Um, and then so the next step is determining what they need to be trained on and the things we need to be thinking about here. Um, is the big thing is, is all employees don't need to be trained on everything, right? Um, we're constantly learning and absorbing information every day. Um, if we train everybody on everything, it's going to go in one ear and out the other. Um, I do not recommend this. This is, you know, when, when you are creating your training program, I really like to do it by departments or job functions. Um, and that way we're just training them on the things that they need to know. Um, so we don't need to do one big training once again at the the beginning or end of the year and just get just to check a box so everyone does the same training um it's not beneficial to do it that way uh, we need to determine what is needed to perform their job duties so for example um if an employee is working on at a critical control point maybe it's it's a cooking uh temperature or if you're using a rat away um to remove to remediate uh flour um, those would be considered uh, critical control points. So may, those employees are going to need training on that specific control point. And so that's relating to their specific job duties. Uh, we need to think about different types of training. So once again, we're, we're really the, the point of this webinar is to talk about more safety and quality training, um, but onboarding training, uh, compliance training. So looking at uh, re regulations, uh, job specific training, soft skills training, uh, product knowledge training, so training employees on, on the different products you have and, and the different functionalities of those. Um, and then where, where we can and as needed, we need to cross train employees. So um, we never want just one employee uh, trained on, on a job duty. Um, if we can, we would like to at least have somebody else cross trained just in case if that employee um, quits or is let go or um, is sick, out sick or whatever, there is someone else there trained to do that role. So uh, always cross train where uh, where you can and uh, especially those those key roles, such as if there's an employee working at a critical control point. OK, so once again, adult learners are, are a little different than traditional students, um, and so these are some this is just general research that has been done over the years on, a, on adult learners and kind of the techniques um, that works uh, when teaching these adult learners. So um, they need to know why they should learn something. So what's in it for them, right? Um, if you just give them, you know, um, a tr training on GMPs, it doesn't really mean anything to them if they don't know why they're getting that training, right? So the reason behind it is to make sure that we're providing safe products and we don't injure or kill anyone, right? If there's, if you explain that importance on why we're doing something, they're going to retain that information a lot better and be more eager to learn. Adults need to be involved in determining what they learn. Um, so it's, I always uh, like to, you know, when we're doing these training needs assessments at facilities, 
uh, one of the things that I always do is conduct a survey with the employees and ask them what they expect to learn or gain from the, the new training program. And so you'd be surprised that your your team members will actually come up with things that you don't think about. And so it's always good to get um, their opinion on that. Um, also, adults typically bring more uh, life experiences to the classroom environment. Um, so asking your employees, especially those ones who do have a lot of experience, uh, to contribute during the training and ask them questions and, and maybe have them give examples where uh, of a scenario where they've had to utilize that skill set or, or whatever. Um, adults are motivated to learn when they have a need to know something or they want to be able to do something. Uh, for example, an employee will be motivated to take a training if they know it's needed to move up in the company. Um, so the, you know, it's a great tool to use for motivation. Um, additionally, adults take a task or problem-centered approach to learning. Um, so, for example, an employee will be more adept to learning if uh, it is helping them with a real life problem they face at work, right? If 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 you are noticing a constant issue or problem at your facility, take that as a moment to train those employees that that are having that issue, and they're going to be more likely to to uh, once again retain the information and be eager to learn about it because they know that's going to help them in their in their job duties, right? Um, and then adults are both internally and externally motivated to learn. Some adults are motivated by self-satisfaction, while others are motivated by rewards and recognition. And that's why building in those milestones and just some sort of acknowledgement uh, of your employees when they achieve their training goals um, is a great way to make sure that you're 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 hitting both of these adults who who are internally and externally motivated to learn. So next, we need to, de to determine when employees should be trained. Uh, when determining uh, when employees should be trained and how often, you should consider the following points. So all employees should be trained on a task before they are assigned to complete the task. Um, how do you expect them to complete a task before they receive training? You would be surprised at how many facilities I go into and they don't even start their onboarding training until after that employee's been there 30 to 60 days. Um, the reason being is because of high turnover, but that's no excuse. Um, you need to train your employees before they are, are you know, released into the facility to perform tasks. Um, additionally, all employees should be trained on basic CGMP or CGAP principles before being allowed entry into processing or growing areas. Uh, training should occur whenever there are significant changes to processes or procedures. Refresher training shall be done at minimum annually, but may be more frequent based on the topic and company needs. For example, uh, once again, if your facility has an issue with employees not washing their hands at the appropriate frequency, uh, then maybe you're going to do a hand washing training each month until your employees get into this habit. Um, so your refresher training is really going to be based off of your employees needs and the needs of your facility. However, it should be done at least minimum annually. Uh, corrective training shall be done whenever a root cause analysis in response to a nonconformance identifies training as the root cause of the issue. Uh, so once again, just using the hand washing as an example, um, say you're doing your pre-op inspection and you notice that uh, Joe didn't wash his hands before entering the processing area and started touching uh, equipment and product and things like that. Um, so you, you conduct a root cause, you find out that um, you know, Joe hasn't been trained in hand washing. He missed that that month of training or or whatever. Um, and so there's a nonconformance that has been, uh, you know, identified, and we're going to correct that nonconformance with with training. So now moving on to creating the actual training content. Um, so there's a couple of things we need to think about before we really dive into how to develop a course. Um, first, you need to determine what training can be created and completed internally and what trainings require a third party trainer or training company. Uh, once again, using HACCP as an example, that has to be a, a course recognized by the International HACCP Alliance. That training company or, or trainer needs to be accredited to provide that course. It is very likely that you don't have someone on site 
um, that can do that or meets those requirements. So that's a training that you're probably going to have to use ex an external company or trainer for. Um, but most other trainings, uh, with the exception of maybe one or two more, you're going to be able to do internally as long as you have uh, subject matter experts within your company that are competent enough to create that training material. Um, so for the training courses your facility decides to create internally, you will need to determine if the training will be live and in person. Uh, will the training be live but not in person? So for example, like this webinar, um, or will the training be recorded and uploaded and, and taken at a different date? Uh, and what I mean by that is, is more of an e-learning style cor uh, course or training program, which a lot of companies, especially bigger organizations, are moving to um, because it, it's great for keeping uh, records and ensuring that your employees are trained at the, the appropriate frequency. So when creating the training course, uh, we need to follow these eight steps to make sure we're creating useful content. A uh, couple of these things are only going to apply uh, more so for the e-learning or, or creating online courses, and we'll touch on those uh, here in a second. So uh, first, you need to define the goals and objectives of the training, right? So earlier, we defined the goals and objectives of our entire training program. Well, when you're creating a specific training, we need to define the goals and objectives of that specific training. From there, we need to determine our target audience. Is it our growers? Is it our processors? Is it maintenance? Is it sales, et cetera? Uh, who is this training for? Uh, step three is more for the e-learning e and online uh, courses. So determining what learning management system you're going to use or what content creation tools are needed to create the actual courses. Uh, step four, you need to conduct research and work with subject matter experts to develop content. Uh, once again, this can be done internally or you can use an external company uh, to develop your trainings or assist you in developing your trainings. Um, step five, create a storyboard. This one is more for online courses and, and same with script. However, you can use that when creating your, your courses that may not be online. Um, but those would just be, it's not by any means required. And what we mean by a storyboard is basically, you know, uh, going down the training. This is what is that's going to be on the first uh, slide or diagram. This is where I'm going to put a video in. This is where we're going to have an activity. So you're basically just creating an outline for that training. And then step six is creating that script. So what you're actually going to be saying, you don't necessarily need to create a script, but it is helpful. Uh, step seven, uh, put content together and record the training. So now that we've done this research, now that we've created this outline and we have our script, let's put it all together, make it look nice, and then record the training if we're, if we're recording it. If we're going to do it live, then we're just preparing for that live training. And then the last step is to add assessments and knowledge checks. Um, so that could be things like quizzes, exams, surveys, uh, et cetera. So additional things to think about when creating your training courses, uh, utilize technology where you can. Uh, once again, e-learning software is great. Um, if, you, if your company has it in the budget, um, if not, there, there are uh, training companies that offer, you can utilize their learning software and could get some training uh, from them. Uh, same with content creation tools. Uh, it's a great technology to be able to create interactive uh, courses and have your learners be more engaged. Um, things Also, things like videos um, are, are great use of technology. Uh, include assessments. So just having your employees or team members go through the training is not enough. We need to assess if they retained any of that information. And if we, we find out that the employees aren't retaining the information, maybe we're not um, giving them the tools that they need in the training to succeed. And so maybe we need to think about our training course and how we can better it to make sure that uh, the employees or team members are meeting our training goals. Uh, one thing that I like to do uh, especially with new training programs, is to have all of your employees do a pre-test and a post-test. Um, this gives you a great idea and understanding of where they were before they took the training and where they were after, and you can close out any gaps from there. Uh, additionally, you should always use uh, real life and current examples where possible. Uh, for example, using uh, scenarios from the industry where there might be a cannabis facility who has had a recall 
or some kind of regulatory issue and kind of use scare tactics with your employees and say, you know, this is what could happen to us um, if we don't do X, Y, and Z. Um, so we need, using real life and current examples is, is a great tool. Uh, include activities, uh, but only include activities if they're beneficial to the learner. And some different activities that you can have is role playing, uh, workbooks, games, et cetera. Uh, don't just try to squeeze these into your training. Make sure that they're actually beneficial to, uh, once again, obtaining that uh, training goal and objective. And then uh, always uh, think about this, the tell show practice model, model uh, when training your employees. So first tell them the information, give them the information they need to know then show them how to do some do the task or or whatever it is that you're training them on and then have them practice it themselves so to tell show practice uh, is a great way for them to uh, once again retain that information so now that we've we've created our content uh, we've set our goals we've determined who and what needs to be trained um, now we can implement our training program and so these bullet points are, are, are keys to helping you implement your, your new training program or your, your modified um, training program. So first, uh, don't try to implement everything at once. Um, you know, you can do things over time. You can roll out trainings. Um, it's always great, especially with a new training program, is kind of to test the waters with one or two trainings and then see how that worked with your employees. And then, um, you know, once again, go back and fix any gaps if there are any. Um, but you don't have to roll everything out at once. Um, and then uh, roll out trainings on a predetermined schedule. So uh, once again, you can you can do it a monthly trainings, you can do it quarterly. However, whatever works for your facility, um, you know, you can kind of fit into to that schedule. Um, key point number three, so monitor your key performance indicators. Um, this is to ensure your goals are being met throughout the implementation process of the new training program. Um, you also need to be agile and adjust any trains that aren't reaching your desired goals. So if you're monitoring those KPIs and realize, well, hold on a minute, um, you know, our employees are not understanding allergen management and they're, they're missing a key point here. Um, well, then we need to adjust that training and um, make sure that we're fixing any any of those gaps and uh, keep us on the right track to reach those goals. Um, we can also survey employees after each training to determine the usefulness. So asking them, you know, on a scale to one to 10, how useful was this training in completing your daily duties, um, things like that. So make sure that um, once again, we're getting their opinion and input on the training program uh, and your employees are going to appreciate that. And then lastly, um, we kind of touched based on this earlier, uh, but conduct a pre and post test to see what the employees already know and what they have learned. This gives you a great idea of if you've implemented a successful training program and if they've retained that information. So moving on to maintaining records, uh, I always say if it isn't documented, it didn't happen. Um, so if you you can go through this whole rigmarole of creating a, a robust training program and you do all these trainings and you don't record any of it, well, when an auditor or a regulator comes in, um, that means nothing to them. So we need to make sure that we're documenting uh, when our trainings happen and, and who's been in those trainings. So uh, training records should include who was trained, the date of the training, who the trainer was, and their applicable qualifications if needed, and what was included in the training and, and you might it might just be easier to include any links to your training materials uh, for that aspect um, but another tool um, that is really beneficial is is a training matrix and so i have two examples here there's a million different ways you can create a training matrix i've seen uh, several different versions um, and so let's start with this one on the the left first um, so you can see here that this is more of a skill based you insert your workers' names on the left side, you put the trainings at the top, and you, you determine their competence in that skill set um, through a one through four uh, numbering system. Uh, one being can perform with help, and four being that they are an actual trainer uh, for that, that uh, requirement or required training. The next one on the right 
Um, this is kind of what I see more typically where you have employees names listed here, you have their start date, and then you have the date um, that they completed the training and then when that training is due. Um, and then you can see the different trainings that they have at the top here. Um, so these are just two examples of training matrix. Once again, there's there's a hundred different ways you can do it. Um, these are just some good examples I found from uh, good old Google. So continuous reassessment and improvement. Um, so once we've implemented our training program, we are collecting our records. Um, we're not done, right? Um, and this goes for any safety and quality aspect in your facility. You should always be looking to continuously improve. Um, and, and training programs are no different. They're not static and they should evolve uh, and improve over time. <coughs> Excuse me. So with that, um, some of the things you, you need to be looking at, you need to review your data from your pre and post test uh, assessments and other activities. Um, to see if your employees are improving. Um, you need to monitor KPIs to determine if training goals are being met. Um, once again, you can survey employees to see what they think of the new training program and if they think anything should be added. Uh, you need to continuously update and revise your training program as needed, but it should be reviewed at least once annually to, de to determine if there needs to be any changes. However, you should be updating uh, or revising your training program whenever there are major changes such as new products being introduced, new processes or procedures, uh, new maybe a new equipment or a new processing line, uh, or maybe changes in regulations, or even if there was changes in whatever standard you're getting certified to. Um, and then I just put the, you know, kind of uh, continuous improvement model that we're, we're hopefully all familiar with, which is act our plan, do, check, and act. And so that's kind of the, the you know, we've done the planning uh, with creating the training program. We've uh, implemented the training program, that's the do. Uh, and now we're kind of checking it uh, with our KPIs and reviewing our data from our assessments. And then we're acting to, uh, to address any changes that need to be made. Um, and so that, uh, concludes this webinar, this lunch and learn. Um, I want to thank you guys for your time today. Hopefully you guys learned a little bit more about how to create a robust training program um, and create some training content for your facilities. Um, once again, I'm Tyler Williams, the Chief Technical Officer with CSQ, uh, the cannabis industry's most trusted source for safety and quality certification. Um, this training was recorded and we will send it out to all the attendees and, and the registers uh, for this webinar. Um, but now I want to take the time to open the floor up to questions. Um, so if you do have any questions, please type them in. Uh, 